welcome to another edition of Bullion Star Perspectives. My name is Ronan Manley and today we're honoured to have Chris Marcus from Arcadia Economics. Chris is a silver specialist and he's a good friend of mine and uh, he once interviewed me so now it's my turn to interview him. So Chris, hello, you're very welcome. Hi Ronan, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be on your show. I, as I think you know, I'm quite a fan of the research that you've uncovered. Certainly some incredible stuff that is historical going back to that Silver Squeeze weekend and lots to talk about that's happened since then. So great to be here and thanks for having me. I know that looking back over a year ago to January 2021, it was a very exciting time with the Silver Squeeze movement. Um, and I actually did quite a lot of research over the next few months at that time into silver. Would you be able to fill me in on any developments you think are relevant that have happened in the silver market, maybe within the last six months? And what are the developments that we should be looking out for around this time? Sure. Well, the last six months have certainly been an active time. We saw both gold and silver rally gold breaking through 2000 again silver was up to i believe 27 28 dollars then they got sold off pretty hard do have the fed raising interest rates so i suppose there's some impact coming from there but now with silver back down at 22 even below 22 dollars at the time of this recording it's interesting a lot of the primary silver miners that's pretty close to their cost of production. And I was talking with a guy from Sierra Madre Gold and Silver yesterday who just did a deal with First Majestic. And they're talking about how you're not having a lot of new projects come online with the price down here. So it's to the point where it's impacting supply. And you had sent me those charts earlier that show that recently there's been more metal leaving the COMEX. I don't know if it's certainly to be clear, I wouldn't say it's panic time just yet, but you see how that number has come down quite a bit since Silver Squeeze weekend, which was February of uh, 2021. So about a year and a quarter ago, we've seen the same pattern of metal coming out of the ETF holdings, just steadily gone below that. And you look back to what happened at that silver squeeze weekend where later the lbma their 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 metals focus guy acknowledges that in his words fears emerged as if they were going to run out of metal he also says they were weeks away from running out of silver had things continued at that pace we thought the numbers didn't add up that weekend that there might be some double counting sure enough lbma also comes out a couple months later and says well we miscounted by almost exactly that number I don't hear anybody explaining that. And you certainly did a lot of research on, on how the same banks are administering all of these silver trusts. We don't have any idea what's going on back and forth. JP Morgan got fined $920 million for manipulating the market. So we're not talking about did the choir boy double, double count here. JP Morgan, even on a deferred prosecution, got fined again last year for using WhatsApp to avoid the regulators. So it's not a very stable situation. You can't even get an audit from iShares. I've called multiple times and tried. And let's put this in the category of things that I, I don't know that there's enough evidence to conclusively say 100% is the case, but you were asking me via email, what's going on with the metal coming out? Well, everything indicated back then that it was tight and we can look at the Silver Institute numbers. They showed last year retail physical demand, coins and bars was up 36%. I think yeah. it slowed this year relative to last year, but it's still elevated above normal years. So basically it seems like they hit a bottleneck last February They've kind of admitted that. Then you have Ross Benham of the CFTC with some cryptic comments that go unexplained while we see the same pattern of the price rapidly plunging repeatedly, which matches exactly what Bart Chilton said when I asked him about the mechanics of when we see this drop, I, I keep hearing that it's the banks buying back cheaper and they're just nudging it because they know if silver is $25.10, they can get it a little bit lower. Then you have algorithms, you throw some JP Morgan headlines or a downgrade report or a Fed headline. There's a lot of trading that goes on without even a person being behind it, but just sees these headlines. And if someone is really gaming that 
and knows the tricks. And I asked Bart Chilton, is that how it happens? And he says, yes. The only difference is that now when it happens, the markets are so much more levered and bigger that the impact is even more. And this is all, of course, happening at the same time. Now we have 8% inflation prints, 11% PPI prints. God only knows what the real numbers are. So it would make sense that perhaps we're seeing the slow bleeding of that metal supply. And based on everything I hear when I talk to the miners and the in the the silver community, it's not getting easier. Their costs are going up. And I get it. It's frustrating for people who are invested where they're seeing this. Why is the price getting clobbered? But if you actually look at physical silver, I'm looking at pandas the other day at 35 bucks. I'm like, wait a second. Isn't the spot price just didn't just go below 22? Buffalo rounds, six bucks over spot, five bucks if you get a big quantity, maybe. So we're seeing the signs of a continuation of that. If there's anyone out there on the banking side that can explain any of that. I'm not saying that they're all lining up to come discuss it with me, but I've, I've yet to hear that. And then add in that you have things going on with Russia where no, now we're no longer talking about gold conceivably as money is like a conspiracy theory. Putin just used it temporarily or to some degree as a component of money and was backing it in the markets. And we saw the market respond at least until they removed that fixed rate. So it's quite a sequence of events. And I think a historic time, I wonder if it's not like that part of the big short where, you know, they really had their emotions tested before the market finally broke. I was going to ask you from your perspective, whether you thought that the Silver Squeeze event was just a one-off event back in February 2021, or else whether it's continued and gained momentum since then. And when I was looking at the COMEX registered stock, uh, chart basically since January 2021, the COMEX registered category has gone from 150 million ounces of silver down to 75 million ounces. So it's literally been halved over 16 or 17 months. So that would indicate that the silver squeeze movement is actually still going on and that it wasn't just a one off event, it's a process that was triggered at that time back in January 2021 and has since continued. So I think there's the chart that you just pulled up of what I'm talking about. You can see that basically from the beginning of 2021, there's been a huge drop, a consistent drop all the way through to right now, early June of 2022. Yeah, the, the chart says it all. The chart of the ETF holdings looks exactly the same. I get it. People were probably excited, wondering if that was the end of what seems like an illogical pricing system back there in February. I remember feeling like there was some degree as if that was when the silver market broke. And perhaps two or three years from now, we'll be looking back at that point, maybe if they've gone to a reset or, or there's been some resolution. Because right now, okay, silver is down at 2169 on the COMEX, yet there's still the debt load. There's still the corner of the feds in where, <laughs> I mean, these guys are even having a tough time keeping up the appearance that they're not going to reverse course. They brought, they brought Bernanke out last week. He's, he, he has a new book out. He, he said the slightly above neutral would be in the, in the threes somewhere. Well, inflation's eight to 11%. So, I mean, they're not like when they think like normalization, they're not like going back pre Lehman. They have a different view of normalization. So, I get it. You know, if someone says, hey, well, I've been watching Silver get clobbered for the last decade. I've been watching it too. And I share the frustration yet. Gee, that pressure is building. None of it's been resolved. None of the reasons that you research gold and silver so much that I focus on silver have been resolved. And I think that chart speaks to it because again, it's really when you sent me this and I've seen a couple other people commenting about it, then it was mixing with what I heard, which I've heard from many miners, not just Greg Liller yesterday. Yesterday, but I'm like, when does the connect happen? We've talked for years about this disconnect between physical and paper. When does, when is there a connect or does it always go on in, in the banks, just hammer it with paper, but it, in that category of things, can I say 100% this is, but it sure looks like it. It sure looks like this is a bleeding of the metal. You mentioned that there could have been a break in the market. And that was the time that the CFT chairman, Rostin Benham, came out with a statement, well, about a month later, in March 2021, where he said, I'll just pull up the quote so that I can read it. In many respects, 
the resiliency and market structure of the futures market really were able to tamp down what could have been a much worse situation in the silver market. So do you think that that is evidence that could be used in a case against the CFTC? Well, we've been investigating that and did speak with a lawyer and laid out, which I've been meaning to publish. It's on my list of things to do so that people can see, because I think it puts things in context. The short answer is that it seems like it's in the category of things that should be thoroughly investigated, yet the degree of evidence and specificity you need to get a conviction against a specific person or entity, it's a little bit hard to do because only Ross has access to the trading records. That and in Ross again, the, the the keep in mind on February first, that's when he put out his warning. Hey, we're monitoring the silver market for any activity. Why? Well, I, I guess he wasn't him who said the social media warriors. Maybe that was Dick Hayes of the Perth Mint. But he said something about you know anyone's social media, especially this happened a couple of days after the meme stocks had started spiking. So I get it. They're seeing their markets start to unravel for obvious reasons. They're levered beyond belief. But anyway, this happens and he talks about the market structure that tamped it down. He didn't overtly say I went and tamped it down, but he talks about the features in the futures market. One of which is that you can expand the supply anytime the demand goes up. So you actually, the silver market does work on supply and demand. It's just supply and demand of paper. If they didn't actually deposit that metal into SLV, that's a fraud, but B it's, it's another form of expanding the supply of silver. Because you look at the records for the banks, it shows it was a, by far a historic amount of metal that went into the trust. All the bullion dealers, and I'm sure you saw the same at Bullion Star, reported the most sales in any period of that they've owned their business. So we saw mm -hmm. the metal go in, and by the time it was done three days later, the price was lower. So now personally, what, what do I think Ross who is as chairman of the CFTC, along with Gary Gensler, Janet Yellen, and Jerome Powell, make up the plunge protection team created by Reagan with the specific purpose of intervening in markets to prop them up where they think is important. So that's not conspiracy theory. They've been doing this for years. I remember back when I was on the trading floor, I'd come in some mornings like, oh, they intervened in the end. Who's the they? That's the plunge protection team. And Ross is on that. I remember around the same time as the Silver Squeeze back in February 2021, Janet Yellen called a meeting on the 4th of February 2021. She as the US Treasury Secretary and she called a meeting with the head of the SEC, the head of the CFTC, uh, someone from the New York Fed and someone from the Federal Reserve and was specifically to talk about the silver price which was rocketing at that time. And the very fact that they were so concerned about a rocketing silver price really shows that the US government and through the exchange stabilization fund must always be monitoring this and when the price goes above a certain threshold that they feel is going to set off a panic means that they have to call a meeting. What was your reaction to the fact that like all the biggest big shots in the Wall Street, CFTC, Federal Reserve were coming together to literally discuss this. I mean, you understand why they're concerned about it. I hadn't heard that Janet Yellen specifically commented on it, but as I've thought about what Ross Benham says and thought about the role of gold and silver, again, I understand we're not using it as money now, although Putin was just using gold as money. And while the US government and the Federal Reserve, they don't like to get into their history very much, we were on a gold standard until Nixon, who doesn't have the finest track record either, took us off the gold standard. So 30 years later, you have Bernanke and they're saying, I don't understand gold. I don't know anybody else who does either. Well, maybe you should. They're holding gold. Countries are repatriating their gold. And you see that the US government and financial system is being run as a Ponzi scheme. I think they would that someone there would have been concerned following 2008 that like, hey, this might be an issue. Do I know formally what they're talking about behind closed doors? No. But I think comments that you mentioned and also the comments that Ross Benham mentioned where in addition to saying the, that the price was tamped down and uh, that they controlled the, the price and volatility, he also says, like, what could have been a much worse situation? Well, a much worse situation for who? If people exactly. buy silver and the price goes up, 
What's the difference if the price of silver is 35 or 28? Why does he care if his job is just to maintain a free and fair market? Although part of the answer to that, I listened to him in his Senate confirmation. And at one point, one of the senators says, are you prepared to take action to make sure that we don't have these spikes in the power energy markets or various markets? He says, yeah, we're hard at work, you know, implementing that. Well, that's very close to price. Fix. I mean, sometimes the markets do spike. You know, here we had a shortage in the silver market for reasons that anyone with common sense who's looking at the inflation around the globe, you know, the first thing they think of is, well, silver and gold is the solution to that. Now we have a hyperinflation. I mean, what is it? I hear it's like we're up to 70% of the dollars printed that exist were printed in the last two years. So in the midst of this, in the midst of a silver buying spree, the price is, is getting clobbered. What I heard from the lawyer is it looks bad. And certainly you would think somebody would, the subpoena power or government power should be investigating, but is there enough for a conviction yet, at least with the evidence file I've collected, I don't think at this point there is, which is not to say it's open and shut. We still have the other JP Morgan guys who are on RICO trial. That brings me to the point about the possibility of a big short position existing on the COMEX and the big commercials one or more of whom might be responsible for that. Do you think there is an outstanding big short position in silver? Um, if so, which banks are fronting that? Would it be like JP Morgan or Bank of America or a combination of banks? Well, it's kind of hard to know the specifics of which bank did which. Again, we don't have those trading records. I know Ted Butler has reported that JP Morgan often was flattish getting out of their large short position. So I don't know who's holding it. I can look at, in fact, I'll pull it up for you. You have the delivery reports that show some unusual activity going on between JP Morgan and Bank of America. And rather than perhaps in saying unusual against the rule code, because you have a 3000 contract limit and here's JP Morgan, 6,500, 4,400, 3,800, 4,800, 3,300. Here's bank of America. This is their house account. I mean, at least the, the JP Morgan, they could say it's on behalf of the customer. This is the house account, 4,949. I've called the CME and said, hey, I, I see, am I reading this right? I know I see the limits 3,000 and these banks are over it. And he says, well, they could have a hedge exemption or they could be in violation. I said, okay, well, these banks have paid a lot of fines for manipulating the market in the CFTC's words on hundreds of thousands of occasions. So which is it? He says, well, we can't reveal that. The CFTC keeps an eye on that. Well, great. I don't really get much information out of there. And Ross Benham, he says the tamp down things, he goes in his other speeches, talks about how he wants transparent markets based on supply and demand. You have the opposite of that. So it's kind of like figuring this stuff out in the dark where... Yeah, even on, even on um, the CFT website, on the bio of Roston Benham, it says that he has advocated for the CFTC to use its authority and expertise to ensure that derivative markets operate transparently and fairly for participants and customers. But obviously that isn't happening. Everything implies the opposite actually. So it's very difficult to have trust in the CFTC when they say one thing and do another. Well, of course, because think about it. The guy who was there from 2008 to 2013, Gary Gensler, when he said there was nothing going on and they closed the report. And finally, I was able to track down Bart Childens five, six years later. He says there was plenty going on. And in fact, he thought they had enough for a manipulation conviction to the degree that he was told no, but he went and had Congress change the actual definition of manipulation. And he thinks under the new standard, they would have been convicted. So he was clearly saying that there was stuff that that wasn't going on, but why, where is the CFTC? Why aren't they telling people about that? And then now Gensler still hasn't said anything, but in 2019, they fined JP Morgan the 920 million for stuff that happened while Gensler was there. And rather than him being held accountable, he's yes, over so at the SEC fixing cryptos with Ross. Exactly. It's like if someone does a good job in suppressing an investigation, they get rewarded with an even bigger job in the future. Um, that's very disheartening for silver and gold investors who can see 
that Wall Street and the US government nexus are literally corrupt in colluding on these matters. Do you think it's silver is so important as gold is that it's a national security issue and that if you looked at it from the perspective of these government and Wall Street agent people, they would argue that yes, we admit that there is price manipulation, but it is in the national interest to do that because we're trying to keep the financial system together. Sometimes I look at silver as the Achilles heel of the financial system, because if the price of silver took off, gold would have to follow suit because they're inherently related. And if that happened, the financial system might collapse. So do you think that it's possible to look at it from a perspective of the government and they're saying, well, we have plans in place maybe to do a revaluation, a biometallic revaluation in the future, but not just yet. So um, they're doing it for an altruistic purpose, ultimately. I'll bet there's a part of their mindset that believes that, although why, why do they have to lie about it? Yeah. Why, why, exactly. why do they, why can't they say these things? But why is it behind closed doors? And if, I mean, if you told me that Ross just came in there and he's saying, Hey, we got, my job is to protect market chaos. So I have to do this. I, I believe it's possible that he thinks that, uh, I mean, there's some other, other things that makes it a little disingenuous when he talks about transparency and markets meeting supply and demand. You could say that COMEX is a flawed system conceptually. If, if he came out and said, look, what do you want me to do? The, the COMEX is the way it trades. It's been like this. They could raise the open interest, close the open interest. You know, it's not perfect right now. Then at least you can say, all right, but can we address what Bart's saying? Can we address what you found? I mean, they put out a press release, but I've, I've actually looked, asked and called, can you claim damages? Because $311 million was set aside for victim restitution but it's only if you traded futures contracts. So the people who are actually trading the underlying thing that the futures contract is supposed to support, they had no recourse from that settlement. And that was something I asked the lawyer about, well, hey, well, they confirmed that there was inappropriate activity during this time period. I had positions that were affected, but they say, well, there's a bit of a statute of limitation. It's too late now. Okay. Yeah. Well, Gary Gensler couldn't find anything. Then by the time they find something and they don't really give you the details, they don't really explain what or how they're going to prevent it from happening in the future. And it's happening again. And now it's too late to do something about it. That's not good market regulation. It's not free market regulation. The guy said comments, which I mean, I'm sure he would explain it a different way, but they sound bad. They sound a lot like price fixing. If you really want to be transparent, I would address those. You are probably one of the few people who've actually gone outside the CFTC building in Washington, DC and done a sort of protest or else stood there with a group of people uh, made it known that you were protesting about precious metals manipulation. And you've also contacted the CFT chairman on probably a few occasions. Do you think at this stage they know your name and they know that you are doing that and that y your name would be well known within the CFTC offices? I've wondered about that. At one point, uh, they, my, partner followed up with them and they mentioned something. Oh, the Arcadia files. If they knew who we were, I've left a couple messages for Ross, uh, spoke with the media director who I was saying, Hey, these are the questions I have. The guy said this, I wrote a long letter explaining, well, are there other times when it's tamped down, he went and told before I found him talking to the Boca Raton futures conference, which is made up of banks. So they knew about it, but no, no one else had heard about it. There was like 70 views on the thing. Are there other times it's going to be tamped down? Should I expect that? Should I just go sell 30 strike calls out the yin yang? Because he's always going to tamp it down at $30. I think these are the questions I asked to the media director. And I said, can you get me not answers, but just someone to speak to and went by for a couple months. Oh, I promise I'll get it to you the end of this week. No promise. I'll get it kept following up, then eventually I get, uh, well, it's an open investigation, so. Oh, so at least they acknowledged your correspondence eventually. I mean, there was some correspondence, but never answering the questions. And then eventually she's like, I just can't comment on that. So, I mean, if you told me because of the JP Morgan trial that's still ongoing for the RICO stuff and that they actually are investigating and, you know, five years from now they're gonna find JP Morgan, 
I wouldn't be shocked if that happens yet. What, what I have an issue with is that the crime's occurring now. We had this silver squeeze thing. It's not just because I'm a little ticked off because I've had some option trade go bad on silver. Yet there's people that purchased gold and silver for decades because they saw what their government was doing. They saw the money printing. And even though Ben Bernanke and Jerome Powell seem shocked that when they raise interest rates, it doesn't go well, people get this. Thanks to people like you, Ronan, and the others out there in the gold and silver community are explaining it. So now we have the 10% inflation, but the hedge that people have turned to, and it's not just conspiracy theorists or silver bugs, Putin's doing it. The other countries are repatriating their gold. JP Morgan is through their uh, their de facto syndicate wings. I mean, they send Goldman, Goldman Sachs sponsored uh, Jeff Curry out on CNBC, and he says those whoppers, he's like, oh, oh no, everything's fine. They changed the documents, which was brilliant that you found, inserting yeah. language about a silver squeeze. So that's, it's frustrating. Is that yet a convictable case in court? No, but it certainly seems to merit more attention. And in the end, whether they ignore it, Ross Bedham said February 1st last year, he's investigating it. So now people are being harmed, especially people who are in their retirement ages who have just been forced to sit home by their own government for the last year or two years. And here they've done the right thing and their government's sticking it in their face repeatedly. So that, you know, if they, if they find JP Morgan in five years, that doesn't change the fact that during these past two years where people were under more stress than ever, now they got Powell jacking up interest rates and their, their 401ks are getting clobbered too. So no, I don't think a settlement five years from now, this is when Ross Benham, if he stood behind his words about transparency and accountability, should be out there explaining it. He goes and talks about cryptos to, concert, to Congress. Why can't he talk to people about silver? Hey, these questions are out there. There's some legitimate concerns. We're seeing the same banks. Yet he says, tamped down by a market structure. You can see the CFTC uh, last year on their YouTube channel. JP Morgan is one of the banks voting on the market structure that tamped it down. So staying with Washington DC for a minute, seeing that the CFTC is based there and the Federal Reserve and US Treasury. Down the road, literally, from all of those uh, institutions is the Silver Institute in Washington, DC, who you would think would be sticking up for the silver miners who they apparently represent. And if you look at the World Silver Survey, which is the annual report published by the Silver Institute, they literally spend pages and pages talking about the physical demand is on fire, the in physical investment demand for coin and bars is up double digits year on year. All of the other categories of industrial demand, including photography, electronics, electrical, photovoltaic, is up. But at the same time, they can't bring themselves to even question why the price isn't reflecting this. Do you think that the Silver Institute is, is doing its job or is it doing a different job while claiming to represent miners? I've actually talked with Michael from the Silver Institute and he's a good guy. I think it's, he it has a different perspective and perhaps their role is to provide information and there's a lot of good stuff. Measure of the numbers. I mean, it's not the easiest thing to do and I, I think it's great anyone who's sharing attention on silver when I spoke with him, this was, oh, geez, maybe three or four years ago. He didn't subscribe to the view of what Ted Butler was saying, what I was beginning to put into a, a book or studying. I guess I've been studying it for a decade plus, but at least he didn't subscribe to the view of it being manipulated. This may have been before the JP Morgan thing. And I understand some people say, hey, well, they're just spoofing it short term. I don't know that I agree with that, especially if you read through some of the court documents where they talk about, you know, the they talk about ramming the price right on the option expiration. It was common practice. So and as an option trader, that stuff matters. You can start adding up some millions if you can pin someone on their positions. I don't know what he would say now. I mean, I I can see both sides of it. And in the end, I think it's good that they're providing information. I guess he, at least at that time, had a different view on what's the cause and effect. I mean, you could say to some degree, maybe it's not manipulation, but you can just raise the open interest in any of these commodities. And it's actually a little bit of a ridiculously bizarre 
system, but I mean, it's, you know, like uh, if you have people who are in real estate and interest rates are going up, I mean, they're trying to sell houses. So, I mean, I think that's not his perspective, uh, but I, I'm glad that they put out information and that's, that's what I think is nice. And what I try to provide with the show. And I know you do, we're just bringing on different people who are studying these things. There's not any one person who knows all of the information, but at least, you know, they're, they're providing one piece of it and they might have a different opinion than I do about the degree that this bank paper contract affects the pricing. But again, I would point back, you had silver squeeze, the most silver bought in the history of the silver market and the price went down. So whether you call that manipulation or a faulty fractional reserve design, it doesn't seem to be matching supply and demand. And I think it's leaving the same thing that I've said, and you said for, for years, there's a big elephant in the room that's not gone away. Moving on to physical demand, seeing that we mentioned that the Silver Institute highlights that quite regularly now in its report. Silver premiums on coins, especially US coins, are quite high, r relatively high versus maybe historical ranges. What is your interpretation of why there are high premiums on silver coins and bars right now? Because retail and investors are buying a lot of physical silver and there's not a huge market compared to, you know, some of the, I mean, it's not like the amount that they're sending in weapons over to Ukraine even. I mean, this is a small market. The industrial demand eats most of it. It's been in deficit the last three years. It was in a deficit before the year before silver squeeze. Maybe go, go a step farther back. We had silver maybe 2016 or let's say 2017, 18. Back then, average cost of production for the miners was 14, 15, 16 bucks. We had silver down at those prices, 17, 18. And finally, when it went through 20, it shot up to 29. I don't know if Ross and his friends were tamping the price down then. Hopefully, he could comment on that soon. But, you know, it just sits there for a couple of five, six years and then shoots up when nothing in particular, except for that JP Morgan delivered, what was it, 30 million ounces to the registered category right before that happened. Then, you know, you have the, that was also following when silver goes to $12, or no, that, that was a couple of years later. Silver goes to $12, you push the price down, people understand it's not matching supply and demand and they're buying physical silver and when you take a step back and look at that chart, like you showed earlier of the, the, the gradual decline. Yes. So now the supply is even tighter. You can still get silver, but there's a lot of products that you, you can't say, well, I want this specific, these, 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 and these, there's a weight on some of them. So is there, a, I wouldn't say there's a shortage of physical silver but there's a shortage of some physical silver products. People are buying junk silver. There's a finite amount. So if you told me that five years from now, this was the beginning of seeing a divorce between the COMEX price and the paper price where it's like, fine, trade your paper contracts, but a year is not easy to get anything out of there on a big chunk. I've never heard of anyone redeeming SLV shares. They put legal language in it to make it as possible and give them as many weasel outs as possible. Yeah. So the, lot, the only thing a lot of people can get is the physical stuff. So that's why, you know, you see 22 on the COMEX, but it's, it's 28. Or if you want Eagles, it's in the 30s. You probably saw that I wrote an article, I think it was early last year, about the inflation adjusted prices of gold and silver. And I took it from two different angles. One was using the current methodology of the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics in the US the CPI index that they calculate currently. And I also took the, another methodology that is produced by Shadowstats, where they continue indices using older methodologies just to show how the indexes would have been if, if they didn't change the methodology. And for silver, this is back last year, even the inflation adjusted price of silver, if you use the current CPI methodology, was something like $140 per ounce. And if you use the old 1980 methodology of the CPI that Shadowstat still calculates, it projects an inflation adjusted high of silver. So basically the $50 high, if you inflation adjusted that backwards, 
it projects a price of around a thousand dollars all-time high. So literally the price right now is nowhere near even the current CPI methodology. But do you think eventually when the pricing structure changes or they can't just keep it under wraps anymore that we could be seeing much higher silver prices? You would think it's uh, an inevitability in some sense. How high does the price go? That will be an interesting one to see. Certainly, I know when you talk about silver as money, people are like, oh, all right, hold on there, constitutionalist. Yet, I mean, up until the similar with gold, it was a couple of years earlier where they ran out of the silver, took that out of the coinage. So then you look at how much money has been, I mean, they didn't even have quantitative easing back then. So you look from then and how much prices have gone up, how many dollars have been created. Probably prices haven't even gone up anywhere relative to the amount of money that's been created. And we'll see how that plays out. But you would think it's a big number. I guess it depends what they go to, which like we said earlier, the debt's still there, the, the QE's still there. They're either gonna stop doing QE now and what's gonna happen when mortgage rates go up. So whoever's holding all the mortgage paper is gonna be a very similar situation to what we saw with the mortgage bubble. In fact, when did the mortgage bubble implode? After Greenspan ra raised rates. So we see the same thing happening in somewhat slow motion. I get it. There's a lot of people who've been waiting and they're a bit tired and frustrated, yet it's a lot of the similar dynamics that people notice in the housing market as a result of the expansion of the currencies and the debt loads. You see the same train wreck in slow motion. It's, it's stunning how long it can be drawn out, but you, you see it happening. Uh, on another point, I think you were probably one of the people that pointed it out originally that when the, uh, a group of Russian journalists went on a visit to the Bank of Russia's vault in Moscow, as well as, and they took a lot of photographs, in those photographs, as well as huge amounts of gold in storage racks, in huge corridors, somebody noticed that there were a lot of silver bars stored in those same vaults. So that means that either the Bank of Russia or else the Gokran, which is a, a strategic reserve run by the Russian government, or else the strategic wealth fund of the Russian uh, Federation, one of those entities is storing silver and large quantities of it. Do you think that the US government also maybe has a strategic silver stockpile, but they just don't tell anyone about it and that it could be located in some anonymous vault, even maybe under the care of uh, one of the bullion banks? Well, I mean, certainly I can't prove that's the case. I, I've, I'll put it like this. I've heard people assert some compelling arguments that JP Morgan is holding that big stockpile on behalf of the US government. Maybe my guess would be that's more likely to be true than not. It's hard to know. A lot of this stuff is anecdotal. You would hope so. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to know who's calling the shots, but at least some of the things I hear in conversations throughout the years, I think there's at least a reasonable chance that that is the case. Well, I've been interviewing various guests over the last year or two, uh, and a lot of them are gold specialists. Some of those conversations come around to talking about the possibility of a reset, which would involve gold as an anchor and a revaluation of gold as part of a new monetary system. But less people talk about the possibility of a biometallic standard where both gold and silver might be uh, revalued upwards and act as um, the backing of, of a commodity base Currency, dual currency system, or should I say dual metals. Do you think that maybe silver isn't being given the importance? A lot of people don't describe uh, the fact that there could be a bimetallic revaluation, not just gold. 
I think that's, that's reasonable. There's some people who seem to see it as a negative that silver has so much industrial usage, although that actually makes it even more, not per outright amount, but in a sense, most of the supply isn't there for monetary purposes, whereas most yeah. of the gold is remaining. So there's a, certainly a rarity when you measure that in. Again, I would let me put it like this. Based on conversations I've heard and what would I not say to anyone, don't buy silver because of this or, or, or invest based on this, but yeah, I think that that's probably something like that, that we're going to see. Because when you take a step back and think about it, there's that stigma of, oh, well, it's just these guys and they're talking about their gold and silver yet. In Paul Volcker's autobiography, I believe it was page 61, he either said they prevented the, they suppressed the price or prevented it from rising coming out of the London gold pool. His language was very, I don't remember the exact words now, but when you actually get the book, it's right before he died. He talks about, we had to suppress the price to keep it from rising or prevent it from rising, whatever the exact words he used were. So that's yeah. Paul Volcker, who was around when we were still on a gold standard. Apparently the gold standard was somewhat important coming out of World War II. You had the Bretton Woods thing. Because like right now, yeah, it's easy to say, well, the government's in control. They're doing quantitative easing, but someone's getting stiffed. And it seems like China and Russia are not enjoying getting stiffed. Someone owns that, owes that, is owning, owed that, that money they're just tacking on debt so there's still that degree of which you know some it has to get resolved somehow keep in mind as much as it sounds like it's out there the federal reserve has already reset the gold price before it was 21 dollars, and then they reset it to 35 really yeah. in similar circumstances following the great depression and then they came out and said hey we have to confiscate the gold in the means of a national emergency. Well, how is it a national emergency if my gold is sitting in your pocket now? <laughs> I think that's a little, a little uh, politicking there. Yet nonetheless, this is the same Federal Reserve bullying the same scam. And now they're even in a more precarious position in fact, you look back to what happened in 1980, really the only time we had anything remotely resembling, resembling something of a honest silver market since when it left the money supply, you know, the Hunt brothers were trying to take their silver and they changed the rules to stiff them. So buy, you could only buy only, but for everyone who says, oh, well, the Hunt brothers did this, they did that. The gold market also rose and the Hunt brothers weren't cornering the gold supply. So we were seeing a run on the currency then. If you look at what the CFTC said back then in this this uh, video I found of him. The CFTC guy actually mentions, he's like, we called the Bank of England and they were, they were really worried. So they were communicating back and forth then. Volcker was helping to suppress the price when they were coming out of the London gold pool and that was unraveling. And I get it, you know, in a high tech, fast paced culture, most people aren't, you know, sitting there thinking about the history from 50 years ago, but it seems relevant. And it, I, I think, like you said, it's going to be one of those things where it'll be one day, they, here's the executive order, here's the, the new policy, or here's the change. Yeah, I think with all these things to do with governments and central banks, behind the scenes, they've clearly planned for contingencies, scenario planning. And depending on what the environment is like, there is a planned scenario that can be rolled out at short notice. So I'm sure there have been simulations done and ready to go and put into implemented practice as regards a revaluation of the monetary metals for use in the new international system. At least there has been a simulation, I would say. You would think so. You would hope so. And I believe so that certainly they noticed what was happening in 2008. I think a lot of people like Ross and his friends noticed what happened in 2021 with the silver market. They're not noticing yet. Putin stuck the gold brick in the face of their sanctions. So if they're, if they're not listening yet, they, they should be. My guess is that there's some people in there who know darn well what's going on. I, you know, and then they put Jeremy Powell out there. Maybe he's just like the fall guy so that they can sit there and con the people. But you would think they would know. Yeah, what's it? Uh, some of the Russian leaders were studying GATA back in 2003, 2004, right. so and then 20 20 years, years. 15, 20 years later, they put a gold backing. So it sounds like they know China's buying this gold for the last 10, 15 years. So there's a reason they want it. If you were the CFTC chairman, if you were appointed as the CFTC chairman, what changes would you make to the trading mechanisms and structure of 
uh, precious metals derivative trading on the COMEX? Because I know you have a derivative background from trading options, so you know about all this stuff. If you were brought in in the first week, what changes would you make to make the market more transparent and more reflective of real price discovery? Well, the first thing I would do is actually speak to people and be transparent because people are sitting out here wondering, I think they're legitimate questions based on what's happened, the history, his statements. So, you know, certainly interacting with people, finding out what's going on. I mean, sounds like a lot of silver miners aren't too happy. Keith Newmeyer is saying, what was this guy talking about tamping down the price? So I think some of these people are owed an explanation. I mean, step number two, I guess on some level they do this with the banking folks, but I don't think the banking folks should be deciding the money's currency. We've had a couple of thousand years track record of that not going so well. At least is a gold and silver standard perfect? Perhaps not, but it seems like a much fairer system when there's a finite money supply for everyone involved and you don't have right now people who life isn't you know going so easier if they're getting laid off if these guys keep jacking up interest rates, we get something like 2008. I mean, you're, you're making life hard for a lot of people, especially people on a fixed income. And I mean, I don't have children now, but I'd like to hope that before I'm gone, we've left behind something a little more equitable than what we're doing right now, because this seems like organized crime. So certainly getting some of the people who have studied monetary policy, who are familiar with gold, so not Ben Bernanke, not Jerome Powell. Uh, they said they don't understand it. Uh, well, fortunately, Ronan, you've studied it pretty darn well. You understand it. So get people who do understand it. So actually start addressing the problem. And then on top of it, uh, this idea of the flexible supply, I know they don't like that because then they can't send uh, billions of dollars in weapons to different places or go build tanks and start wars. Yet, why can't, I mean, if Hey, I don't know how much this hedging really goes on. I have yet to talk to a silver mining or gold mining company that has ever told me about them hedging anything on the COMEX. So I understand the back in the day where, you know, prices are unstable. I'm not, I'm sure there's some people who the hedging is, is relevant, but can we have some sort of commodity backed hedging? This doesn't seem like we're reinventing the wheel. I mean, any military application or bank derivative product, there's, there's plenty of money to develop those. We could come up with CLOs, CDOs. Certainly I think it's possible to at least investigate the concept of some sort of commodity system where there's some sort of backing it may be, hey, if it's cattle, you need to do a different setup, fine, but at least investigate the possibilities of having some sort of backing. So rather than just an open supply of contracts that can be increased at any time, that defeats the purpose of supply and demand by nature. Would you be able to say, seeing that we were talking about Ben Bernanke, do you have that silver sculpture to hand, the one that we mentioned earlier? Is it right there? So this is very- Yeah, he's uh, right, I mean, he's right here. There's Ben, uh, let me get him a good angle. There's Ben Bernanke with spinnable propellers. So is this a one-off piece or is it a range that's now being produced? No, we're, we're in the process of making Silver Chopper Ben available for sale. <laughs> so we'll, we'll have one fly onto your desk soon. It's interesting. They're manufactured in China and have to get shipped through Hong Kong. And because of the supply chain issues, it takes longer than expected right now. Yet that is the world we live in today, I suppose. So Chris, it's been really good talking to you and we've covered a huge amount. And it was great for me as well to get an update on what's happening in the silver market, because you're probably the, the go-to person, the first person I think of when I think of silver. Well, I think that's great because you've done some great Great research on silver. You, you did some instrumental things that helped me to find some of the other things last year with those great articles you wrote. And certainly, I think one of the things that goes well about silver, it's not just one person's going to cover all this, but, you know, Bill Murphy and Chris Powell from GATA and yeah. all the others that have spoken about this. Uh, I think with an underlying hope for a more equitable and fair system is at least what helps me to keep continue digging into that some days so on that positive note i think we'll wrap up so thank you very much again for your time chris thanks so much ron always fun talking with you